Hi everybody, welcome back. Good to be with you again. Today I wanted to share some books uh, on a couple of different topics on Ar Arctic regions and on resets. Uh, regarding these first five books, I haven't read them, so I'm hoping that someone, some of you out there can download these and read them. Uh, I'll leave the links below so uh, you can. Uh, yeah, this first book it's called Chronology of Voyages into the Arctic. Um, it was published in 1818, but it's about each chapter is about a different century and all the voyages recorded therein. Uh, so chapter one is about the uh, 15th century. Chapter two is the 16th. Chapter 3 is the 17th, chapter 4, 18th, chapter 5, 19th. So, um, but it wasn't actually released until 1818. Um, and I couldn't find them older voyages written anywhere before this date either. But uh, yeah, these are the collection that I've got in, that I've found in the past, but I'll be able to get the links for them again anyway. But, um, this second book was also published in 1818 uh, it's called the possibility of approaching the North Pole uh, so I did notice this paragraph in the prefaces um, I pulled this book up uh, through Captain Phipps found it sorry though Captain Phipps found it impossible to penetrate the wall of ice which extended more than uh, 20 degrees between the latitudes of 80 and 81 degrees uh, I knew that was there was a wall in Antarctica I didn't realize there was one in Arctic as well, maybe he's at Greenland or something, I don't know. But if, like I say, if someone can read this, that would be great. Um, the third book I've got is Voyage to the Pacific to Cooperate with Polar Expeditions, um, published in 1831. Um, I haven't read that either, to be honest. Uh, one thing I did notice is, yeah, like I say, the all the books have come around after 1812, that year that we've talked about before. But uh, 1818, even though it's got older stuff in it, this was when it was made. And so, yeah, the, that was the third book, made in 1831. Fourth book, Narrative of a Second Voyage in Search of the Northwest Passage, made in 1835. This one was made for the European Library, but in English, so foreign languages must have been quite well known in the 1800s. But like I say, I haven't read these, so please do download them, read them, find out what they're saying. This one's the Arctic Expeditions from British and Foreign Shores, 1877. <laughs> Um, yeah, one thing I did kind of notice in the little bits of snippets I did see on them is um, everyone seems to be fighting to circle cold waters and none of them, from what I gather, seem to be talking about the lands up there. So um, if anyone can read these and find out if anyone does mention about the northern lands, that would be good. Um, this next book is also about the same subject, but it was... It's called Baron Trump's Marvelous Underground Journey, and it was released in 1893. Um, it's apparently a bi biographical uh, notice of Willi Wilhelm Heinrich Sebastian von Trump, uh, also known as Little Baron Trump, and it's about him and his dog. Um, this book is, anyway. And how they go on uh, sailing and find uh, access to the inner worlds. Uh, I've read some of this book before, uh, quite a long time ago, I can't really remember it, so I've read snippets here and there yesterday, and uh, yeah, there's quite a few really interesting bits in it, I don't know, I don't know if it's true or not, but it's really interesting, and if anyone can find anything in this book that correlates with any of these previous books, that would be great, but I doubt you will. Uh, it's just, it just seems, <laughs> I don't know. 
Um, I'll get into it anyway. Uh, first of all, the thing I thought about was being Trump. Is it, you know, Trump's um, ancestor? Being that in this book, the Trump family are wealthy and they buy a massive plot of land, basically a village or something. And then he goes off sailing and leaves his parents behind and goes off with his dog to look for the uh, inner world or access to it. And uh, yeah, uh, Bulger is the name of his dog and his dog's really smart as well. And um, his dog kind of, in chapter one, his dog convinces him that life's lame and he's got to go back on voyages. And yeah, by chapter four, Juliana is some um, strange lady on the street that tells him about the giant's well um, in the north and him being a, a voyager wants to go there and when he tries to convince her to go uh, she's like you know I'm a frail old lady I, you got to go over rocky mountains and die if anything you, you should send someone that can actually do that kind of stuff and he's like don't you know who I am I am that man and gives her a lump of gold and and basically um, yeah she agrees to go with him to show him the way and then uh, later on <laughs> I'll read a bit out. Yeah, <laughs> I won't say anything. I'll just read it when I get to it. But uh, yeah, by chapter nine, uh, he found a pipe of the funnel. All right, sorry. So in chapter eight, he's still coming through the quarries of the de uh, demons. How the cattle kept the trail and how he came to the last upon the brink of the giant's well. Uh, basically, yeah. It was, as I read in a bit, he, he's there's really bad weather and that, and he's following some cattle as they're going up a mountain to safety and it's his only way of getting safety is by following them but ends up in the place he was looking for um, yeah and then he finds the funnel that he has to go through at the bottom of the well and basically sends his dog first and then ends up going himself and, and then talks about what happens while he's there in the inner world and the types of oops the types of beings that he meets and what, what describes what they're like and the queen of them and what she's like and the fact that um, in this world you're transparent and a day and night is different at each time because it's to do with the twilight times and there's beds everywhere and the, the state owns all beds and no one owns their own bed because no one knows when day or night is going to start or end because it's different each time and therefore as soon as night is declared all beds appear out of the walls or the floors everywhere and it's known as the land of beds <laughs> and uh, yeah you go to sleep there and then wherever you are so you could end up at the other end of your land and someone from that end could be somewhere near your house and it could be declared it's uh, night time and then you, you know you could sleep in each other's beds <laughs> well in the state's beds i suppose quite strange but yeah the other strange thing is you have um, an opening on the front and the back of your body so as to everyone in the place could see your heart and by doing so um, everyone can see your inner thoughts and know your inner feelings and although that they can where clothing to cover that um, it doesn't really cover anything it's they're known as the transparent people because you know they can tell what each other's thinking feeling and all that but they still sometimes cover it anyway uh, yeah it's really interesting and then it goes on about um, moving on down the marble highway and finding other places and beings uh, just loads and loads of stuff you would probably not have heard of anywhere else and Flatwater did a book, uh, read a book about a father and his son uh, going to the North regions, going through and seeing uh, lands with giants in um, but they're different descriptions to these as well so um, if anyone can get find that book or share the link with me uh, that'd be great because I'd like to read both of them see if I can find any connections anywhere 
Um, but yeah, so getting on to reading some of this book, I'll just jump to a page. So yeah, this is basically where he's trying to find the well. Um, Oh, did I go past it? Anyway, no, yeah. Suddenly, um... So up, still up, through the quarries of the demons, how the cattle kept the trail, how they came last upon the brink of the giant's well, the terraces safely passed. So once within the quarry, this is, uh, without, I can't be bothered to waste time reading it all silently, uh, looking for it, but basically this is a man-made quarry from the past, ancient times, which is referred to as the demon quarry, somewhere up in the north. Um... Once within the quarry, however, all sense of fatigue vanished. My, my thankful mind, uh, entranced and fascinated by the deep silence, the awful grandeur, the mysterious lights and shadows of the place, uh, lent me new strength. At length we traversed this city of silence and gloom, and once again we emerged into the full glory of the afternoon sun. Suddenly my little drove off the cattle, with playful tossing of their heads, broke into a run. Bulger and I sat at the hills. However, it was a mad race, but dear friends, when it ended, I took off my fur cap and tossed it high into the air with a wild cry of joy. Bulger broke out into a string of yelps and barks. I looked the cat were grazing my dear uh, life in front of me. And as their breath reached my uh, keen nostrils, recognised the odour of Yuliana's herbs, which she had bound on her herd her head yeah so Yuliana is that lady I mentioned before the old lady that told him about this place and I think I've missed it I think it was somewhere early on but she's with him and they, they're at, they're on the journey and they get to a land where there's people there and they can't she's the only one that knows exactly where the giant's well is even though everyone knows about it even where they are on their journey as I say but they're stopping for um supplies and stuff and a wizard touches this witch by on the hand um, as she passes by to get the supplies and he knows that they're on their way to the giant's well so he starts shouting to everyone they're on the way to the giant's well go and get them stop them uh, stop everything you're doing so all the men around that hear it all stop what they're doing and chase and um, him being already far off he can see in the distance but uh, yeah what he can see is her eventually slowly coming down the mountain with loads of people beating her and um, he goes on to describe himself in a book but yeah uh, do I be a brave man and go and save this lady uh, do I be a coward and run away um, no I did what was good of my name and I turned around and I stretched myself out on the moss and so did my dog and we slept <laughs> 15 minutes later we woke up and we knew what to do we got on our way and we wondered who could show us the way <laughs> I don't know, it just made me laugh and I thought you know if you saved the lady she was apparently the only one that knew where it was and instead of going to sleep you know <laughs> oh, it just made me laugh anyway but uh, yeah so yes we stood almost upon the brink of the giant's well but I was too tired to take another step farther, too tired, in fact, to eat, although I had a uh, stock of dried fruit in my pockets. I noticed that the nests of the wildfowl were well supplied with eggs. Having unloosened the tackle from the back of the goose, uh, the good beast uh, that carried up the mountain for me, I showed myself the ground and I was soon fast asleep with my faithful bulger coiled up against my breast. So, yeah, he talks about here where he's at the Giant's Well, rather the edge of a vast terraces of rock leading down to it, each of which was from 30 to 50 feet in sheer height. Before I go any further, dear friends, I must beg you to remember that I'm an expert in the use of tackle, 
where being uh, no knot, noose or splice, known to a sailor, which I didn't have at my finger's ends, a fact not to be wondered at when you take into consideration the thousands of miles which I have travelled on water. Nor would I have you shake your ha heads and look only half persuaded uh, when I describe the descent into the giant's well. For of course you will be asking yourselves how I succeeded in getting the tackle down when there was no one left at the other end to unite it. Know then that her was the smallest of my troubles, for as any sailor will tell you, you only need to tie your line in that what is known the fool's knot to one end of which you make um, fast the mere cord. The moment you have reached the bottom, a sharp tug at the cord uh, unites the fool's knot and your tackle falls down after you. My method was to lower Bulger down first and then to let myself down after him. In this way we proceeded from the parapet to parapet until at last we stood upon the very edge of the vast well, the existence of which had been so mysteriously hinted in at Don Fum's manuscript. Its mouth was probably fifty feet in width, and by straining my eyes I could satisfy myself of the existence of a shelf of rock on one side, as nearly as I could judge about seventy-five feet down. It was a goodly stretch, and it would require every foot of my rope. You will not smile, I'm sure, when I tell you that I pressed Bulger at my breast and kissed him fondly before lowering him away. Uh, yeah, that's his dog, by the way. Uh, he returned my caresses and by his joyous help gave me to understand that he had perf uh, perfected faith in his little master. In a few moments I joined him in the narrow shelf of the rock. Below us now was darkness, but you think I hesitated? I knew that my eyes would soon become accustomed to the gloom. I also knew that when my eyes failed, Bulger's keener ones would then help me out. So this is really small for you guys on the screen. Hopefully I can get it any bigger. So yeah, in a few moments I joined him at the narrow shelf. And then I rigged my tackle now with extra care for I was uh, re-entered my little brother in a sort of trip of disc discovery. He was soon out of sight and then, in spite of my calmness, I drew a quick breath and my heart steeped uh, a barely corn or so. Um, but hark, his quick, sharp bark comes plainly up to me. It means that he has landed upon a safe shelf or ledge and the next moment lay my eggs my eggs, <laughs> my legs encircled on the rope, and I began to glide noiselessly down to the silly depths, the stilly depths, um, his glad voice ringing in my ears. So yeah, he let his dog down on the rope first with a fool's knot, and then he followed down after. I don't want to end up reading bits and bobs of this, uh, reading all of this sorry until I run out of video time so yeah I'll just jump on it was uh, page 66 there was something as well I think it was a description of them people transparent people so as Bulger and I directed our steps towards one of the benches uh, with the intention of taking a good rest Long growl from him warned me about the alert. I gave a second look. A human being was seated on the bench beside myself, and I was uh, with curiosity to come face to face with this inhabitant of the underworld, the first we had met. I made a halt, determined to ascertain, if possible, whether he was quite harmless, therefore accosting him. He was small in stature and clad entirely in black, a sort of loose flowing robe, um, much like Roman toga. His head was bare, and what I could see of it was round, smooth and rosy, with about as much hair, or rather fuzz, upon it as the head of the infant six weeks old. His face was hidden by a black uh, 
fan which he carried about in his right hand and his uses of which you will later learn on you will learn later on sorry <laughs> his eyes were shielded from the intense glare of the light by a pair of colored uh, glass goggles as he raised his hand between me and the light i couldn't help catching my breath uh, by the way this is like a really bright white place like uh, arctic is uh, so it's blind into his eyes and his head too was only a little less opaque suddenly towards from Don Fum's manuscript flashed through my mind and I exclaimed joyous joyously Bulgar we're on the land of the transparent folk at the sound of my voice the little man arose and made a uh, low bow lowering his fan to his breast where he held it A baby face was uh, ludicrously sad and solemn. Yes, sir, stranger, said he, in a low musical voice. Thou art indeed in the land of the Mikamukis. Sorry, the Mikamenkis, the Mikamen. Is the land of the transparent folk, called also Goggle Land. But if I show thee my heart, thou should see that I am deeply in pain to think that I uh, should have been the first to bid thee welcome. For know, sir, stranger, that thou speakest with Master Cold Soul, uh, the court depressor, the saddest man in all Goggle Land. And by the way, sir, permit me to offer thee a pair of goggles for thyself, and also a pair for thy four-footed companion. For our intense white light would blind thee both in a few days. I thanked Master Cold Soul uh, very warmly for the goggles and I proceeded to set the pair of soft pride on my nose and to tie another on the front of Bulger's uh, eyes. Then in most courteous manner uh, informed Master Cold Soul who, who I was and begged him to explain the cause of this great sadness. Well thou must know little Baron, he said, after I had taken a seat beside him on the bench, that we the loving subjects of Queen Galaxa, whose royal heart is almost run down. Excuse these tears, living as we do in this beautiful world, so unlike the one you inhabit, which our wise men tell us is built, strange to say, on the very outside of the Earth's crust, where it is most exposed to full sweep of building snow, freezing blast, pelting hail, drowning rain, and choking dust. Living as we do, I say, in this vast temple, nature's own hands builded uh, where disease is unknown and where our hearts run down like cloaks that may have but one winding. We are prone, alas, to be too happy, to laugh too much and to spend too much time in idle gaiety, chattering at the time away like thoughtless children, amused with uh, bobbles or hobbles, I can't see that, delighted with tinsel nothings, Knowing then, little Baron, uh, that mine is the business to check this gra ga blah, blah, gaiety, to put an end to this childish glee, to depress our people's spirits, lest they run too high. Hence my garb of inky hue, my rueful countenance, my frequent outflowing of tears, my voice ever attuned to sadness. Excuse me, little Baron, uh, my fan slipped then, did Thou see me? Oh yeah, sorry, yeah, at this bit, he's holding his fan at his heart like I read just before, covering it up like I mentioned earlier. And he got a bit worried. Excuse me, Baron. My fan slipped then, did thou see through me? I would not have thee see my heart today. For some way or other, I cannot bring it to slow pace. It is dreadfully unruly. I assured him that... If I'm struggling to see this, and you're probably definitely struggling to see this. Oh, okay. <laughs> anyway, yeah, so here he explains it, and I assured him that I'd not seen for him yet. Now, dear friends, I must explain by the laws of the 
um, Mikamenkis, each man, woman and child must wear in their garments a heart-shaped opening on their breasts directly over their hearts with a corresponding one at the back so that under certain conditions when the law allows it each may have the right to look at his neighbour's heart and see exactly how it is beating, whether fast or slow whether throbbing or leaping, or whether pulsating calmly and naturally. But this privilege is only accorded, as I have said, under certain conditions. Hence, to shut off inquisitive glances, each Mukamenki is allowed to carry a black fan, with which no cover the heart, uh, with which to cover the heart-shaped opening above described, and in this way to conceal his or her feelings to a degree. I say to a degree, but I may as well tell you right here, that falsehood is unknown, more correctly stated, impossible in the land of the transparent folk, for the reason that the so wondrous, wondrously clear, limpid and crystal-like are their eyes, that the slightest attempt to say one thing while they are thinking another, royals, the clouds, um, royals and clouds them as if a drop of milk had fallen into a glass of the purest water. As I sat gazing at this strange little being seated on the bench there beside me. I recalled a conversation which I had with the learned Russian at uh, Solvitshegodsk. Said he, speaking of his people, we are all born with light hair, brilliant eyes, and pale faces, for we have sprung up under the snow. And I thought to myself, how delighted, uh, how entrance he would have been to look upon this curious being, born not under the snow, but far under the surface of the earth where this vast chambers of this world within a world, this strange folk had, like plants, grown in the dark, deep cellar, gradually parted with all their colouring until their eyes glowed like orbs of pure crystal, until their bones had been bleached to amber clearness and their blood coursed colourless through colourless veins. While sitting there, following out this train of foot, trail of foot, um, the clear white suddenly began to flicker and to play fantastic tricks upon the walls by dancing in garbs of ever-changing hues. Now brightest yellow, now palest green, now glorious purple, now deepest crimson. Ah, little baron, exclaimed Master Cold Soul, that was an uncommonly short day. Rise, please. I made haste to obey, whereupon he touched the spring, and a bench uh, opened at the centre, disclosing two very comfortable beds. In a few moments, night will be upon us, continued the uh, Mikamenki. But thou seest that thou have not been taken by surprise. I should explain to thee, little baron, that owing to the capricious, capricious, sorry, capricious manner in which our river of light is apt both to begin and to cease flowing, we are never able to tell how long a day or a night will prove to be. This is what we call twilight. In thy world, I suppose, day goes out with a terrible bang, for our wise men tell us that nothing can be done in the upper world without making a noise, that your people really love noise, and that the man who makes the greatest noise is considered the greatest man. <laughs> Owing to that fact, uh, little baron, that no one in Goggleland can tell you how long the day will last, or well, how long it may necessarily to sleep. Our law permit no one uh, to set any exact time when a thing shall be done, or to exact any promise to do this or that on a certain day. For bless thy soul, that day may not be ten minutes long. Hence we say, if tomorrow be over in five hours long, come to me at the end of the beginning of the sixth hour, and we never wished each other uh, a plain good night, but say good night as long as it lasts. What more, little baron, as night is apt to come upon us, this way unawares, by law all the beds belong to the state. No one is allowed to own his own bed, for when night overtakes him, he may be at the other end of the city, and some other subject of the Queen Galaxa may be in front of his door, and no matter where night may overtake a mil milamenki, he is sure to find a bed. 
There are beds everywhere. By touching a spring, they drop from the walls. They pull out like drawers. They are under the tables and divans um, in the parks. They are in the marketplace, by the roadside, benches, bins, boxes, barrows, and barrels by pressing a spring may in an instant be transformed into beds. It is the land of beds, little baron. But ah, behold, a twilight goes to its end. Good night as long as it lasts. And with this, Master Cold Soul stretched himself out and began to snore, having first carefully covered up the two holes in front of his back. So yeah, um, there's loads of stuff in here. I've got two more books and about two minutes to do it. Sacred Fear of the Earth, this is about resets from um, 1726, but about great resets, and he talks about known as the conflagration. Really, really interesting. Um, I've read some of this as well, but these two books have taken up a lot of my time, and I've got another book that I've got to do videos on that I'd like to read as well, uh, Lost Book of King Og, so uh, not much time. But definitely download this book and read it, because it talks about the sacred fear of the earth. Um, talks about how um, the Stoics, who are the Greeks, especially of all these sects among the Greeks, have preserved the doctrine of the conflagration, made it a considerable part of the philosophy, almost the character of their order. This thing so well known that I need not use any citation to prove it. Um, but they cannot pretend to have been the first authors of it neither. For besides that amongst the Greeks themselves, Heracles and Empedocles, more ancient than Zeno, the master of the Stoics, taught this doctrine. It is plainly a branch of the philosophy taken by the Greeks, for it is well known that most ancient mystic learning from the Greeks was not originally their own, but borrowed in the more eastern regions. So they're basically saying that all the Greek stuff, when they were great, wasn't even invented by them. It was taken from the eastern regions. Um, by him, Pythagoras, Plato, and many more who travelled there and traded the priests and knowledge and philosophy when they got a com competent stock, returned home and set up a school or a sect to instruct their countrymen. But before we pass the Eastern nation, let us, if you please, compare the Roman philosophy of this subject um, with what are the Greeks. Romans were a great people made by a show of learning, and then it goes on, yeah. Um, about different people and this is the book of adam and eve story of resets cataclysms definitely really good they'll all be in there please download them especially the last three they're the ones i'm going to be reading at the moment and i'll speak to you all soon thanks for watching god bless